This morning we start a new sermon series, two-week sermon series called Let Go and Let God, The Rhythm of Forgiveness. It could also be called The Flow of Forgiveness because we believe that Jesus has a pattern for our lives of receiving forgiveness and extending that same forgiveness. What often happens is sometimes there's a block in that flow where we receive the forgiveness but aren't so willing to give it to others. And today we're asking Jesus for a bit of help when it comes to how we can be a forgiving people towards others. And the Apostle Peter struggles with this as well, and he asks Jesus about forgiveness. He comes to Jesus in Matthew 18 and he says, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. And then he says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in, You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is, how your heavenly, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from the heart. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Lord, sometimes when we receive your word, it is sweet to the taste and then turns bitter as we recognize the implications it has in our lives. So Lord, I ask that you would allow this text to sit with us this day, that through your Holy Spirit would work within us to help to become the people you've called us to be, a people who don't hold on to resentments, but instead are in the flow of your forgiveness and grace and extend it to others. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Are you familiar with that concept of the flow? I don't just mean go with the flow, like do whatever pleases you, but it's often used, especially in sports psychology and other places, when you see an athlete performing at their peak, they can't miss a shot, right? They, they are just hitting, they're throwing all those balls right in the strike zone. The ballerina is so graceful. They talk about that person as being in the flow. It's like they can't do anything wrong. You may have seen it in musicians. Like any time you watch a Beth or Hong Fong play piano, it's like they're in the zone, they're in the flow, they're in that groove. And it's like even without the music and time sort of stands still and you watch them doing what's naturally God has gifted them to do. To be in the flow is to be moving with the energies and the talents that one has been given and without having to think twice about it to be able to perform exactly the way one is supposed to do so. Now, to get in the flow is a difficult thing. And yet it happens with any habit that we have. We're all in the flow with a number of different habits that we wish we weren't in the flow with. And at the beginning of the year, when we do New Year's resolutions, we often say, this is the direction I want to go. So I want to start working out. So you start to do that. And at first it's difficult, and the more you do it, the easier it becomes to the point where if you're a marathon runner or something like that, you get in that state where you can go mile after mile after mile without a single bit of pain. But throw a stumbling block in there, a couple days or months off, an injury, and then when you start back up again, it becomes incredibly difficult to get yourself back in that place. 
Or maybe you went to the doctor one time and the doctor said, hey, it's time for you to change your diet. You're going to go on an all-kale diet or whatever it is. <laughs> it's time for you to <laughs> ingest more leafy greens than you thought possible. And you're doing really well. You become a salad eater for a while. And then it's Super Bowl Sunday and you have all the food out there and you can't, man does not survive on celery sticks alone. Um, or you smell Chick-fil-A or, or whatever, you know, and, and, and it becomes easy to start eating in the habits that you had before. It happens in any of our habits. And Jesus, when he talks about, when he talks about our spiritual life, the regular practices that we as Christians should participate in, it's like there's a sort of flow to it of, of fasting and praying and giving. And we know that it's true in our habits of faith. To be in the flow of our faith, maybe when you first became a Christian or first received your third grade Bible or first went to camp or first had that spiritual high and you went home and you began to read your Bible cover to cover. Or maybe you skipped to the Gospels and you read the Gospels and you couldn't get enough and you kept reading the letters and, and, and it was like you were in the flow of your faith receiving all that God had for you and then something happened. You either had other homework or you got into some novel or TV show that took your attention otherwise, or maybe you got into the arguably pretty long and boring parts of the scriptures that are difficult to read, and, and you found it difficult, and, and maybe there are times where it's a long time before you pick up the scriptures again, or, or the way in which the scriptures talk about the flow of prayer, to pray without ceasing, and there are likely have been times in your life where you have felt close to God, and that that prayer is indeed conversational, you can almost hear the voice of God speaking back to you as you pour out your life to God and then something happens. A prayer goes unanswered or a prayer against something, that thing actually happens or, or maybe there's illness or just laziness, whatever it is, and then you get out of the habit of prayer and it takes forever to get back into that. We all experience this with COVID. You know, most of us, many of us have been attending worship pretty regularly, like every week. And then COVID happened, and then we stopped, like all of us, for a long amount of time. And it was difficult with all of the different precautions and the new habits that had formed to get back into the flow of being present in worship, whether in person or online. When Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount is talking about the life of a Christian, of those who follow him, he understands that there's a certain flow to the life of faith. He says, when you fast, when you pray, when you give, and then he gives some bit of instruction on what that looks like, of what it doesn't look like, and then how to do it well. And then when he gets to the Lord's Prayer, he, he, he even tells us one particular area that is most likely to take us out of the flow of our faith. The thing that's most dangerous or threatening in our relationship with God, of receiving God's grace, experiencing that grace, and extending that grace out to others. And it comes in an unexpected place. I want you to hear these words from Luke, excuse me, from Matthew chapter 6. Words I know you'll find familiar. This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Good so far. And forgive us our debts as we have often forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Wait a minute. <laughs> Should we read that again? And forgive us our debts as we have often, as we also have forgiven our debtors. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Anybody want to say, ouch? Did Jesus really say that? And is that what he means? Well, a couple of notes. First off, it's fascinating that this aspect of forgiveness is the only part of the Lord's Prayer that Jesus gives a little side commentary on. Right? He says, give us this day our daily bread. Everybody's like, we got it. Food sounds great. Right? Lead us not into temptation. Great. 
But the forgiveness part, he gives a bit of commentary on. Everything else is laid out simply. This one has requirements and expectations. One scholar wrote about this particular passage saying that if the Sermon on the Mount is the summary of Jesus' teaching and if the Lord's Prayer is the center of the sermon, then the teaching on forgiveness is at the very epicenter of the entire gospel. Understanding this, understanding this aspect of forgiveness and how it works itself out in the Christian life is fundamental to staying in the flow of God's grace. And Jesus seems to be saying there that there's something about unforgiveness that can block the flow of our ability to receive God's grace and to live in that in our daily lives. One of the ways in which we read scripture, we don't take a passage completely out of context. We get in all sorts of trouble when we take one verse and we cherry pick it and make our entire theology about one thing. One of the ways in which we read is we read that verse within the context of the passage and then that passage within the context of the book and that book within the context of the whole of scripture and then we read it all through the lens of Jesus which leads us to know that when Jesus is saying this, what he is not saying is that you are not forgiven. I mean, that's our entire faith. It is built upon the work that Jesus has done for us on the cross. The work that we could not pay the debt that there was because of the, of the sins of the world and our own sins as well. And so as the perfect substitute, Jesus dies on the cross, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and not just the world, as Wesley says, but even mine. And it's in that moment where we receive justification. It's that moment where we are indeed saved. 1 John 1, 9 says this, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. There's no ex- there are no exceptions here. There are no caveats. There are no buts or read the fine print. No, the work of forgiveness has been done. Jesus' work on the cross has indeed paid it all. When he says it is finished, he means that it truly has been accomplished. However, we know that in the life of faith, it's not just about the moment of salvation or about the change in status that we have before God when we go as one who is a sinner to one who is a sinner who is saved by the grace of God. Wesley talks about it as the, a house, a house of grace where God is constantly beckoning us to come and hang out on the porch and to come in the house. But at some point, we take the door ourselves, we open it, and we are welcomed into the family of God. But once we're inside, that's not the end of our faith. We have the entire house to explore as we grow closer and closer to God, and to God's people. Jesus seems to be telling us that for followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, those who are committed to being in that flow of life with him, of giving and praying and fasting and following, that there is nothing more dangerous to our ability to experience God's grace than our unwillingness to forgive. For if you do not forgive others their sins, neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. Jesus seems to be talking about some sort of flow, a rhythm to that forgiveness. And a sign that we have received forgiveness is what? It's that we are a forgiving people. Though there is nothing that separates us from the forgiveness and love of God in Jesus Christ, and though our salvation is not contingent upon us forgiving others, I believe Jesus is telling us that our holiness, our sanctification, our ability to fully live into the grace that God gives to us is. It is. Simply put, while on earth, the extent to which we, experiences, we experience God's forgiveness is intimately related to how much we extend forgiveness to others or we don't. There is this rhythm, this flow of forgiveness. And if we're out of the flow, we're called to do anything we can to step back into it. 
You hear Peter, he goes up to Jesus. He says, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister? And he says, as many as seven times? You see, Peter knows two things. One, Peter knows the other rabbis, and he knows that in their day, it was three strikes, you're out. Fool me once, fool me twice, fool me three times, and you're out. And you had done what the, what the law, the, what religion had required. But Peter also followed Jesus, and he knew that Jesus had called him to a higher way. And so he was willing to even say, seven times? I mean, that's being pretty generous. And Jesus says, Peter, stop counting. I tell you not seven times, but seven times seven, or 77, or depending on your translation, 70 times seven. Forgive so many times that you can't even keep count. And Jesus doubles down on this. He says that there was a man who had a servant who owed him 10,000 talents. Now a talent, the amount of money, it was an amount of money, not a skill, not a gift, but a talent was equal to 20 years wages for a day laborer, one talent. So I'm not great at math, but 10,000 talents equals 200,000 days of a day laborer's wages. Would any master, would any king ever let his books get that far out of control? This is meant to be a hyperbole. This is a ridiculous amount of debt. This is an unsurmountable amount of debt. And so the man goes on behalf of his family and he begs and he pleads, be patient with me and I will pay back. And the man takes mercy on him. If he took justice on him, then he would have put him in prison because that's what he deserved. But the man took mercy on him. He forgave him the debt. And at that moment, he passed the buck of responsibility on to him. Well, as the story continues, he goes, I don't know, he goes to the store and he sees his buddy who owes him 35 bucks. It's not 35. This is a bag of silver. It seemed, but, it's, but it's like, it's meant to be a tiny little amount to a huge amount. So the guy owes him like 35 bucks. It makes it easier for me. And he freaks out and he starts choking the guy in the middle of Home Depot. <laughs> And he says, pay back what you owe me. And everybody around sees what's happened. And they go and tell the master. They said, the guy that you just forgave of the 200,000 whatever, he just choked the guy over 35 bucks. The master calls him back. At this point, the master has changed his tune. Because the man clearly had not understood just what he had been forgiven. And he showed that in his inability to forgive another. Now here's the application. The application is that we can never fully comprehend just how great a debt of sin that each of us have before a holy and righteous God. But just like the man with the 200,000 years of service, it's not a debt that we would ever be able to to pay. And so in Jesus' act on the cross, he takes away that sin, that guilt, that debt. He takes it upon himself. He declares, it is finished. Your sins, which are many, are forgiven. And then he expects those who understand the weight of this forgiveness to go and to do the same to others. And for most of us, at some point in our lives, we get that. We understand the weight of what it looks like to be set free from that burden of sin and shame and to be able to claim what is always true, that through what Christ has done, we indeed are forgiven and set free. But we're not set free to turn around and hold things against everyone who wrongs us. In fact, the parable teaches us that that's a different, a whole different form of bondage. Because the man was set free and yet he kept a record of wrongs of others. 
And that's what happens when we have experienced wide the flow of forgiveness. It doesn't take long for that flow to start being clogged up like a stream with mud and sticks and rocks and dirt. The dam begins to build and the water begins to get backed up and the flow stops altogether. And we know what that looks like. People sin against us. Past hurts, resentment, spite, anger, grievances, resentments. It doesn't take long for us to look in the scriptures and see just where the problem is. In the, in the uh, bulletins today, you'll see one of the texts that I was going to use was from Judges 13 through 15. And if you want to see where forgiveness goes wrong or what life looks like without forgiveness, look at the life of Samson. Look at the stories of the Old Testament. It doesn't take long for Adam and Eve in eating of that fruit to turn into brother killing brother and then vengeance being done where seven people are killed. In Samson's story, it's insane. Go back and read it. They'd have to like, you know, X-rated story uh, on, on a TV show because the whole thing is about violence and vengeance and it starts over a slight that happens at a wedding party and it ends with thousands of people being killed and a bunch of foxes being burned alive. Go back and read it. It's interesting. It's strange but interesting. We know what it looks like for our resentments and our bitterness and our anger to take hold and to block the flow of forgiveness in our life. But the, and the choices that we make not to forgive and to hold on to those things, they keep us from receiving the very thing that God wants to give to us and what God wants to allow to flow through us as well. There's a flow. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. Forgive us, O oh God, in the same way that we forgive others. And I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be forgiven in the same way that I forgive others. I'm glad that God takes the initiative on that and shows me the way of forgiveness. It's the flow of our faith to forgive. It's our way of life. It's our calling. It's the example that Jesus said, but that does not mean that it's easy. Corrie ten Boom, who uh, was a Dutch watchmaker, lived from 1892 to 1983. And in the early days of the Nazi occupation, uh, worked to hide Jewish families in their home. Well, she was caught and arrested and sent to a concentration camp along with her entire family. And while there, she watched her sister killed and heard stories of her other family members who were executed as well. She continued to keep her faith and years down the road as she began to travel all over the world preaching, she goes to Berlin one time and she writes about this. She says, a man came to me and said, Miss Tin Boom, I'm glad to see you. Don't you know me? She says, suddenly I saw that man. He was one of the cruelest overseers in the concentration camp. And that man said to me, I am now a Christian. I found the Lord Jesus. I read my Bible, and I know that there is forgiveness for all of the sins of the whole world and for my sins. I have forgiveness for the cruelties I have done. I have also asked God for the opportunity that I could ask one of my own victims for forgiveness. So, Fraulein Ten Boom, will you forgive me? And she said, I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. And when I saw that I could not forgive, I knew that myself, I had no forgiveness. She says, do you know what Jesus said about that? When you do not forgive those who have sinned against you, my heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins. I knew, oh, I knew I am not ready for Jesus to come back because I have no forgiveness of my sins. I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. Then I remembered a beautiful text from Romans 5, 5, that the love of God is shed abroad into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. And I said, thank you, Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred. At that same moment, I was free and I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love 
the ocean of God's love stream through my arms. You've never touched the ocean of God's love as when you forgive your enemies. Can you forgive? No, I can't either, but he can. And so I wonder who it is for you. Who's that person, those people that you just can't forgive? Maybe it's something that happened at work a long time ago, a business deal gone bad, a partner stabbed you in the back. Maybe it's something that a kid, one of your children said or didn't say. Maybe it was something that a teacher, well-meaning, said to you when you were really young. It's been that voice in your head telling you what you can't do. Maybe it's something that has been said by a spouse. Maybe it's something that was said across the pews, maybe even here in this room. We all have those things. We all hold on to those things. And it doesn't matter how long ago it happened, whether it happened last year or earlier today in the parking lot. Choosing to hold on, choosing to hold tight, is a way in which we block the flow of God's forgiveness in our lives. For some of you, it may be that you've been holding on to some pain, some hurt, some resentment, and I want to give us an opportunity today, before we sing our closing hymn, to take some time in quiet prayer. Because today can be a day that you ask for God to remove that bitterness, that anger, that resentment in you, and to allow that forgiveness to flow through you into the lives of others. Because for doing so, not only do you set that person free, but you experience that freedom yourself. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for the cross. And we thank you that the work that was done on our behalf on the cross is not something that just happened that day, but continues to have effect even to this day and into eternity. Lord, you have forgiven us such a great debt. You have forgiven us of all of our sins. And so we humbly come before you with those places in our lives where we are holding on to anger and resentment, and bitterness and unforgiveness. Yeah, we just can't forgive. We know that you can. God, help us to let go. Help us to let go that we might fully receive your grace, experience your forgiveness, and then live in true freedom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.